So we are very glad to have Daniela Agostini from MPI in Leipzig, who is going to tell us about singular curves, degenerate data functions, and KP solutions. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure visiting Stanford virtually. And um, so thank you for having me. And so like, uh, uh, so I, I thought I would take the excuse that today that now here is kind of late uh, in, in Europe. So I will give a kind of relaxed seminar and uh, it's going to be an introduction to a circle of ideas that have been, have been working on recently uh, with other people like Turku, which is here, I just saw it, hi. And uh, um, right. Right. and uh, yeah, so it's about some the the circle of ideas coming. It's actually was born in the past, and now we're kind of uh, I'm I, I've been working on it with other people on uh, something on a different point of view. So let me start by introducing the 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 word in the title that might be less familiar to to an audience of algebraic geometers. So that's the KP solutions. So. Let me start with the KP equation. So um, the KP equation, it's a, um, this is a PDE, a partial differential equation that uh, on uh, one function that depends on three variables, X, Y, and T. X and Y are special variables. T is a time variable. And the equation is very easy to write down. It's a nonlinear partial differential equation, which goes like this. So um, this equation uh, arises uh, in physics. And um, what does it do? Well, it describes uh, the motion of waves in shallow water. So um, in shallow water, you have like uh, the coordinate x, y. So it's their planar waves uh, and uh, the function at u, at u, x, y, t describes the height of this uh, uh, wave at time t there. And uh, it actually happens. Uh, you can see it happening in nature. So for example, if you look at the Wikipedia page of the KP equation, that's a nice picture of some waves uh, that are taken off the coast of France. Uh, and uh, such, it, you, you see a kind of a very regular pattern. And uh, this pattern can be described by such a question. But um, the interest for us, uh, at least for me, it's that uh, this has um, this has surprising connections to um, algebraic curves and abelian variables. So let me start by um, describing a bit this connection. And in doing so, I would like to introduce uh, some uh, concepts like the, the, the theta functions in Jacobians from a very, very elementary point of view, because then we can generalize it to a different setting. So <clears throat> now we take C to be uh, as smooth projective algebraic curve over C of genus G. And uh, um, well, all you can think of it as like a compact Riemann surface of genus G. So like uh, you can of course think about it as like a plane quartic, uh, something like that, like X4 plus Y4 uh, minus one equal to zero or like a Riemann surface of genus, uh, of genus three. So a torus with G holes. Something that we know is that the genus is uh, the topological genus. Uh, it's equal to the geometric genus. So we can find a basis uh, omega one up to omega G. This is going to be a basis of holomorphic differentials. And uh, um, but what's the purpose of differentials? The purpose of differentials is to be integrated. And uh, 
well, what you do here is the take a base point on C and um, we integrate the differentials. So we have a map, which is uh, take a point P on the curve and then integrate uh, the various differential on a path that goes from P0 to P. And uh, of course, uh, so indeed this is very elementary. And of course, you know that uh, this map uh, is not well defined, right? Uh, a priori, because uh, here my base point P0 and my aim point P, there are various ways that I can go from P0 to P. So I can go with this path, uh, I can go with this path, and a priori the integrals will not be the same on the two paths. And actually, they will not be. So what do you do? Well, um, you want uh, to, to resolve this ambiguity. You want uh, that the integrals along the, the cycles to be, to be zero. So uh, they, they actually, they, uh, the well-defined object here is the Abel map, which goes from the curve now to um, the set of all complex numbers where we have imposed the condition that the integrals along cycles are zero. So this means that uh, you, well, the integrals, uh, the cycles uh, on uh, the curve or on your Riemann surface, uh, they build a discrete group, it's the H1 of Z. And uh, taking the integrals along these cycles uh, gives you a subgroup of uh, C to the G, a sublattice, and you quotient by the sublattice because you want everything there to go to zero. So these are like the integrals along the cycles. in H1 seeds. And um, this is well-defined now. They made, now these integrals uh, make sense. And um, this object here is the Jacobian of the smooth curve seed. I'll see, and, uh, and it's an abelian variety. So in particular, it's a, an abelian variety. Uh, in particular, it's an algebraic group, but uh, uh, it's an algebraic group and the algebraic structure is actually projected. So that, uh, that's where the abelianity comes from. Well, that's what abelian, abelian means even if it's not clear from this perspective, but uh, it, it turns out to be, to be true. So, and the Abel map is a morphism of algebraic variety. Good. So, um, uh, of course, this abelian variety is an algebraic group, so we can uh, actually extend this map to uh, a Cartesian product of C, or like if you want to, effective divisors uh, and uh, uh, well we just sum the corresponding integrals like p0 p9 omega 1 and um, this is again the able map but for um, with more points and uh, the most important theorem on this, uh, the most important result on, on this whole theory is the one of Abel, which describes uh, uh, precisely the fibers of the map. So um, two points uh, are in the same fiber, if and only if uh, the divisors are linearly equivalent.
and um, so the, the central result on this uh, topic, very classical, very fundamental, and uh, this gives you this gives you uh, lots of information. Um, one information that it gives you is that uh, you have a morphism of algebraic varieties. Um, this theorem tells you how to control the fibers. In particular, you can then you can also compute the dimension of the image. In particular, one can easily see. So, sorry. That. Uh, uh, the dimension of the image of the able map with g minus one points. Is again g minus one. So the you able theorem will tell you that the general fiber here is zero dimensional. So um, the dimension of the, well, the general fiber is actually empty, but like the general fiber onto the image is uh, zero dimensional. So um, uh, you will get the dimension k g g minus one is g minus one. So um, and this is uh, uh, so this is a divisor. Because the Jacobian has uh, dimension G, since it's the quotient of a complex torus of dimension G, it's a divisor called uh, the theta divisor. Of C. And um, uh, right, so sometimes it's denoted by theta. Theta divisor, well, let me put it. Uh, later, theta divisor denoted by theta. But uh, so this is a divisor in this Jacobian. The Jacobian is uh, a quotient of the complex torus. So if we pull it back to the complex torus, we get a divisor. So if you pull it back in C to the G, we get a divisor there. Now we are not anymore in the algebraic world, we are in the analytic world because we when pulling. So the map that sends C to the G to the Jacobian is not uh, morphism. But uh, nonetheless, it's analytic. It's nice. So the um, so this divisor pulls back to an hypersurface in C to the G, which has an equation So it's an hypersurface. It will have a certain equation. We denote it by theta. And this, uh, the function that gives you the equation is called the theta function of G. And uh, this is the theta function. Oh, uh -huh. so. And now, um, right. So, and uh, with this, now I can state uh, finally this connection. So, between the curse and the KP equation. For this, also, this is a theory that exists uh, independently of the KP equation. It's a very old theory of Riemann. And uh, the surprise came from a result of Kricherver. Who prove that uh, uh, there exist, uh, exist vectors u, v, and w in C to the g, and the constant uh, in C, such that uh, this function here of three variables. So what you do, you take uh, essentially twice uh, the logarithmic derivative of theta evaluated that u times x plus v times y plus v times w times t. That's not translation. And uh, this is a solution. This is a solution to the KP equation. OK. 
So, uh, so, so Daniela, at, at this point, mm -hmm. so this seems like a huge miracle at this uh, Yes. So, uh, so the, uh, so this depends on the curve. So you, you need a, you start off with a curve. This isn't just a random, uh, and this curve, somehow then the curve gives these vectors u, v, and w, which are determined by the curve, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, and then OC, and then for some reason, this is true. And this is like, a, there's, after the, I don't really have a question. That, like, is it like a, just a calculus? Where did this come from? Is it just that? Is there some other part of mathematics that someone looked at and that Christopher said, "Ah, maybe." I mean, right. So, like, uh, that's that, that. That's really kind of a still. It's I, I. I see this result. I think uh, at the time that's kind of a, mar a miracle. And uh, uh, yeah, I will try to give some some comment on it. Afterwards. So, like, Christopher points of view. Point of view is. Um, is the one of the theory of integral system. So it comes from mathematical physics. And then um, what you can do in general, you can uh, rephrase um, in that theory, you can rephrase this uh, KP business by a, a kind of a lax pairing uh, thing. So in this case, you have uh, two commuting differential operators in a way. And then uh, these two commuting differential operators, they produce you by kind of a, they, they, they realize that doing uh, lots of computations, that uh, these uh, two commuting differential operators uh, kind of produce uh, a curve. It's called this, the spectral curve uh, that kind of encodes the common eigenvalues of all these uh, uh, commuting differential operators. So this was automatically a plane curve that you got out of it. And then this plane curve uh, uh, is the same curve that we have here, essentially. That's like uh, the thing. And now, uh, but I would like to, uh, one of the things I would like to say in the talk is a slightly different point of view on the thing that maybe sheds some light. But thank you for the question. And then this is like, uh, so if you want to have uh, any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. This is a good point. And uh, right, so this is the connection. It's uh, very surprising. And uh, um, so let me make some comments about it. So some remarks. Um, so maybe I can tell you directly what are these um, these uh, vectors u, v, and w. So you you can take these vectors u, v, and w by taking the um, um, the vectors u, v, and w can be obtained as follows. So it's very concrete. You take a point P on the curve, C, and then you um, take a local coordinate in the um, Lehman surface sense. And then each omega, um, you can write each omega i as like a F. Since it's an holomorphic differential form, you can write it as an holomorphic form and an holomorphic function in these local coordinates times the standard differential. And then uh, what are u is simply the omega one. So this, this u is like the forms evaluated at p. V, you derive them once. And W is the second, more or less. So that's with. Uh, so here I should put like a one half and a minus somewhere. So more or less, it's uh, it's that. So U, the vector U is kind of tracing the canonical curve, and then uh, V and W are taking some tangent directions in there. So like one one tangent, and then yet another tangent. And um, so, um, well, these things that I defined kind of, the, so this thing depends on the local coordinate. So um, what happens if, if you see that you, you can change a local coordinate and you see how U, V, and W change. So what you realize at the end that uh, this, the set uh, of such U, V, W is naturally an algebraic variety. Uh, that um, 
case study with Turku, which is here, and Stulfels. And we call it uh, the Dubrovin trifold. of C. And um, so this is um, Boris Dubrovin, uh, was a famous, uh, passed away recently, was a famous uh, mathematical physicist and uh, did a lot of work on this and essentially studied uh, uh, this object very deeply. And then we studied it recently from um, point of view of, like computational algebra geometry or like uh, bit out of some combinatorial uh, construction or explicit uh, examples uh, in low genus. And uh, it's in a paper that you, it's called the Dubrovin trifold of a curve. So we study this object uh, if you want to look at it more. But one thing that you can see, it is very concrete. So you can really obtain it uh, out of the differentials. Would you mind going back to the, uh, to the Critchever result with the, where the- Yeah, UW yeah, sure. Just to, uh, right, so, and so you only end up going two differentials in. So now this relationship doesn't involve more than the two differentials, okay. Uh, Right, exactly. So then, uh, uh, so you mean that you don't end up uh, deriving more, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's that's a good point because, uh, well, I can just make it the comment right now since you since you said that. So the KP uh, equation is actually the first one of a family of equation called the KP hier hierarchy, and uh, uh, so there are more of them. And uh, the equation of higher order, you can solve them if you keep uh, deriving. So that's uh, that's uh, that's one thing that's going to come up also uh, later. I hope. So yeah, that's uh, that's a good remark. And uh, right, so that's this. And uh, something else I can say is that uh, I said in this case. So, but like, uh, uh, well, let's just give a name to these things. So such solutions. So these are not all solutions to the KP. There are many more, but such solutions are called. Uh, Quasi periodic from the quasi periodicity of the theta function. And everything here is explicitly computable. What's the meaning of explicitly computable? Exactly. So the meaning of explicitly computable is like say that you start from a curve something like uh, the curve of before equal to zero. Then you can compute uh, the um, well, one basis of differential. It's easy to compute. I can something like this. And uh, then we can Construct explicitly the theta function, the vectors u, v, w, and the constant c. So uh, you get uh, you get the solution. So like um, you really you really can compute them uh, numerically because uh, the thing here is that the theta function, the numeric uh, part, uh, it's uh, in the theta function. So in particular, theta can be computed in terms of the Riemann theta function. Which I'm not going to define, but it's, uh, well, you can think of it as an infinite linear combination of exponentials. So for every n in this multidimensional lattice, you have uh, one exponential here and some, some coefficients that are in C. So these, uh, and the coefficients are also very explicit. Uh, you can see it in every book of abelian varieties, but we are not going to need it uh, now. And uh, everything, uh, so it's an uh, infinite linear combination of exponential 
and uh, um, can be computed uh, on a computer. So like there are programs like in Sage, uh, uh, Maple, Julia, MATLAB, that will compute it uh, up to a certain degree of uh, precision. And this will also give you um, a solution up to a certain degree of precision that is going to be pretty good. So this was implemented already for like, uh, it's implemented numerically for curves of genus. So for curves of genus up to two or three. So it was used to simulate really water waves. So people look at water waves and then try to figure out what is the curve that best approximates them. And um, this was worked out. And then we are working on a more general similar project with Turku and uh, Bernard de Konik in the University of Washington, Seattle and uh, Mark Bennett, uh, which is a student of him, Charles Wang at Harvard, and uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's, it, that's the group. So that's going, it's a project that's going to happen in the future. And, um, right. So let me, so uh, does this answer your question of what does it mean to be explicitly computable? Okay. And so down the last remark I wanted to make here is that, uh, so Klischewer, as I said before, used the, the theory of integral systems. So in a recent work with Turku, and John Little, we take a slightly different point of view and uh, um, we, uh, we give, uh, so we take a, a point of view based on two ingredients. So we kind of decouple the part of the theory that comes from um, the integral systems from the part of the theory that comes from algebraic geometry. So uh, the part of the theory that comes from integral systems is called uh, uh, the sato grassmannian This is uh, a kind of infinite dimensional Grassmannian. And well, it, it is an infinite dimensional Grassmannian. It was introduced by Sato. And uh, this is the object uh, that uh, uh, encodes uh, all the theory. So this is the, uh, the object that uh, parameterizes all formal solution to the KP equation. And uh, this is the thing that one needs from the side of mathematical physics of integral systems. So now I'm going to be a bit vague on this, but uh, if you want more explain, uh, something more, I'm happy to give more details. And then what is the, uh, actually the ingredient that we need from the side of algebraic geometry? The ingredient that we need from the side of algebraic geometry is very classical, it's able to. So, and um, so the first part, the sato Grassmannian is an object that lives per se, just depends on the KP equation, has nothing to do with curves, uh, a priori, so it's, it's there for us. And uh, the thing that we need from curves uh, is Abel's theorem. So uh, this means that one can do the same kind of uh, uh, procedure whenever we have Abel's theorem at our disposal. So um, everything works for singular curves as well. Because for a wide class of singular curves, uh, we have still Abel's theorem at our disposal. And um, in the rest of the talk, I would like to uh, consider two classes of curves, uh, two classes of curves that we studied. So 
The first one is uh, those of rational nodal curves, uh, and the second one is that of uh, more singular curves that I'm going to introduce later. But um, yeah, maybe I can ask uh, if there are any questions or. I think you're going to answer them then, yeah, you know, such as like, uh, uh, when you say everything works with singular curves, and I guess even what Apple's theorem needs for singular curves is not completely, well, I guess we'll, we'll find out since you're going to go all the way to rational curves with lots of singular. Yeah, so like uh, the sense Abel's, you have Abel's theorem for like uh, any, if you have a Gorenstein curve, then Abel's theorem is there for you. So that's, uh, that works very nicely. So if you have a curve that uh, can still be fairly singular, so um, and then, then it will work. So yeah, and then you can start, uh, you can see what happens with different kinds of singularities. And like the first kind of singularities are like the, uh, the most simple one. So one is, uh, so second past now is rational. Okay. Yeah, so now our curve is not smooth anymore. Let's see is um, um, union of rational curves with at most uh, nodes as singularities. So these are the familiar curves from that you see in MG bar, for example, right? I mean, you see in like the very deep stratum of MG bar, in the sense the, the only singularities that you allow are nodes, so they are fairly tame, very well studied. And uh, our main example here will be uh, the irreducible rational model curve. So this will be a rational curve with G nodes. So this is uh, uh, a rational curve with G nodes, uh, irreducible. And again, this is a very, very concrete object, uh, even more so than a smooth curve, because uh, you can just describe it by taking P1 and prescribing uh, G couples, uh, so G pairs of points that you identify. To produce the nodes. So such a curve can be described by giving uh, two G points on P1. Okay. So uh, then you do the same. So the, the same, the, the very elementary procedure that we had before also works uh, for uh, these curves. So now we take a smooth base point on C. And then you can still take, uh, so G is um, the arithmetic genus. So arithmetic G. And this is like a basis. Uh, of meromorphic, oh, well, sorry, these are basis of canonical differentials. On C, so these are um, these are now um, some the meromorphic uh, differentials on P one with uh, um, some properties at uh, uh, the nodes. So these are, so these are meromorphic, these vague, but uh, these are meromorphic differentials on P1 that satisfy some residue uh, conditions uh, at the point that you glue together to get the nodes. And uh, for example, in the case that we have before, these are extremely concrete. For these are given by this expression. Very, very, very easy objects. So we can integrate them.
And if we integrate, for example, in this case, uh, we see, well, the integrals now it's, uh, it's easy. Now I can do it. It's just a logarithm. And so we have an evil map. which goes from C to, uh, again, C to the G, so. So C, instead of C, you actually essentially take it as a map uh, onto the normalization of C. So this would be P1 and not defined everywhere apart from the points that you go to the nodes. And this would be this map here. Uh, and um, and here you see very concretely the same issue that we had before, right? So these integrals uh, are again not well defined because the logarithm of a complex number is not well defined. To make it well defined, we should uh, quotient by something. So the thing that we quotient with uh, now it's by. Uh, Again, by a subgroup, but not by the full subgroup. So kind of by uh, Z to the G. So what we do here is just taking the exponential. So now if you take the exponential of a logarithm, this becomes well defined. And uh, if you look at what I have done in terms, it's the same thing that I have done in terms of before. So I, uh, I took the cycles that, have, that were left on my, on my curve, and then I set to zero the integrals along this cycle. So uh, the well-defined map is the one uh, is the one here. So uh, well, the one without the logarithm. In this case, I have, I have again an algebraic group, which is uh, now the generalized Jacobian of the curve. So uh, in this case. The generalized Jacobian of the curve. And I have the same setting as before. So like um, I have an algebraic torus, uh, I have uh, Abel's theorem in this setting that works the same. So I can extend the Abel map to like higher, um, higher, more points on the curve. And uh, I have again, the theta divisor, which is the image of, um, um, uh, so we have again, the theta divisor theta, which is the image of CG, CG minus one. So, uh, and again, if I pull back this theta divisor from uh, onto the, the vector space that's living upstairs, that's living upstairs, I will get, uh, I will get it as the zero locus analytic function, which is uh, now a degenerate uh, if you want it a function. And uh, um, from this, uh, we get again solutions of the QV equation. But uh, what one can prove is that. Uh, uh, so that's it is a theorem in a joint work with, uh, so uh, this is in a joint work with uh, um, with me. So it's me, um, Claudia Fevola, it's a student of me and Ben Sturmfels at the, at the MPI. Um, so Yelena Manderstam,
um, which is a student of Bernd in Berkeley and Bernd. And this is also based on a work that we did preliminary with uh, Turku and Bernd. So this theorem morally tells you that uh, so morally that these uh, degenerate theta function is a um, finite linear combination of exponentials. So So it's like the theta function of Riemann, but now we don't sum over infinitely many points in the lattice, but we sum over finitely many points in the lattice. So where C is finite. And we can also end, um, so we describe the set C in terms uh, of the tropical Riemann matrix. Riemann matrix of C. So, um, yeah. This, this is, okay, this is really neat. Did, um, so in between the two, uh, as it as you sort of acquire more uh, nodes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's some like is it? I mean, is this sort of completely transverse to the other to the sort of the smooth case, or can you see it degenerate to this somehow? Uh, is there something? No, like so like if you acquire more nodes, I think so. The the thing that you get. Uh, so I I didn't work. So it's not explicit, but uh, it's something like. Uh, um, so say that you, you will get something that the function will be of this form, so finite linear combination in say one variable, and then it will keep being an infinite linear combination in the other variables, in the other, so is that one through you. So if you keep, uh, if you, you start from a smooth curve and you go, to, you degenerate down to the curve where all components are rational, then what will happen to the theta function is will uh, degenerate. You keep uh, degenerating down to these things. So, like uh, for example, you will get something a finite combination of theta function in less variables, something like that. Right. And, and the and the remaining things are like the theta functions coming from the normalization of the of the curve. Right. 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 That's, right. that's great. Okay. That's it. And and, uh, and and then what if you have if you have worse than nodes but still Gorenstein? Then, yeah, yeah. So that, that that's going to be the next, the last part of the, the last oh, part. Excellent. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, so this is actually uh, so the theorem is not is not uh, so our contribution here maybe it's rather than that the one of um, describing the the um, the finite set in terms of the tropical Riemann matrix. So the uh, the techniques that we use uh, that we use are those of tropical geometry because it's the natural techniques to use when you have a curve degenerating to such a rational nodal curve, right? To such a curve with nodal singularities. And uh, then you can, with techniques of tropical geometry, you can define a tropical Riemann matrix uh, and uh, you, uh, you can describe this uh, set C in terms of some Voronoi and Deloney combinatorics kind of things. And, uh, but the fact that you get this kind of uh, expression, it's, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of, uh, there in the literature anyway. So what we do is we make it a bit uh, precise in that sense. And um, right, and uh, so these, uh, these solutions, uh, so we still get solutions. So again, we get uh, AP solutions from the same formula of before. Um, that are called, uh, now these are called soliton solutions. And these are actually the most widely studied class of solutions in, of the KP. So, um, 
they were studied by other people in any in other contexts uh, so they appear in kind of combinatorics uh, they are connected to like uh, um to positive geometry in this history of tropical grassmannian and um, so they appear from many po different point of views like uh, physicists have explicit formulas for them and uh, in this uh, perspective it uh, they appear from the point of view of this kind of this class of person so like uh, um, uh, rational model person and um, this situation is studied by um so in at least two papers uh, of, uh, of us. And uh, so the paper by that I was studying before myself, uh, uh, so the paper before myself, Fevola, Amanda, Sam, and Stulfels. And then, uh, so in this general case, and then another paper by Fevola and Manderstam. in which they focus uh, in the case uh, of this curve. And uh, here they, they connect uh, in particular to something that I like, and then they get like a shot, they go to in the direction of shot key problem for such curves. That I might say some words about it at the end if you want. But now let me go to your question, Ravi. So uh, this was one class of the solutions that we studied. And then uh, um, what the, the thing that we see here is that the curves become singular, the theta function, the degenerate one becomes easier. So uh, we started with the infinite linear combination exponential. Now we've got a finite linear combination exponential. So. Um, was this situation here. So when C uh, is smooth, so more singularity, more singular curves. When C is smooth, then theta is an infinite linear combination of exponentials. When C is rational nodal, so more singular, theta is a finite linear combination of exponential. And uh, so what would be an even more simplified version of the theta function? Well, up to now, the theta function it's uh, simpler and simpler, but it's still analytic. So it's always uh, an analytic function. To bring it uh, to uh, even lower level of complexity, we could ask that this analyticity actually disappears and the theta function is just a polynomial. So no infinite uh, uh, power series anymore. And uh, so uh, the question is that, is there a curve that these are a class of curves that are even more singular, such that the theta function is actually polynomial. And um, uh, yes, so uh, studied uh, recently by, so in a paper by myself, uh, Turku, and John Little. So let's say C in is an irreducible Gorenstein curve. Um, so has a, a polynomial theta function if and only if uh, uh, C is rational again and uh, has uh, only a unibranch surprise. So 
So unibrand singularities means that, uh, okay, um, our curve should be rational. So the normalization is going to be P1. And uh, unibranched means that the normalization is actually bijective. So it's a uh, nomeomorphism. Right. Over each singular point, uh, there's just one point in normalization. So unibranch singularities are kind of higher order tasks. And um, yeah, so that's the that's uh, uh, that's the result. It's a rather straightforward actually. And uh, and uh, what uh, so what the harder one harder result is that in this case the um, theta function. So the theta polynomial in this case has degree at most g times g plus one over two, where g is the right metric genus. So this gives a bit uh, a parallel of the result of before. So in the result of rational level curves, uh, we can uh, describe the support of these uh, theta functions somehow. And here we kind of we can say something on the support of the polynomial. We can say the degree of the polynomial. So, okay. so let me conclude with an example that maybe clarifies this kind of phenomenon. So, um, so take C. This is the image of this map. Uh, then, the, well, this is the normalization map of C. C is rational. And uh, as uh, one unibranched singularity at uh, this point, if you want to check, I think it should be this one. And then we can uh, um, we can do the thing of before, so a basis of differential. is given by uh, these differentials here. So one is the U, U with the U. So U is a local coordinate on P1 now. So what, what's the uh, what's the genus of the image? Is it genus? It's seven? genus four. Right. It's, it's, genus it's, four. it's canonically embedded. It's like a canonically embedded. Exactly. Genus. It's a canonically embedded curve of genus four. So it would be the intersection of um, cubic and um, quadrant. And uh, uh, so these are the differentials, and uh, we can uh, we can actually integrate them. So in this case is even easier. Uh, so, uh, and well, what you see here, you see now the for the first time our differentials are just the integrals are well defined without having to do anything, right? So before we had to take a quotient uh, because there were tough things uh, that I couldn't even write down. So then it was they were logarithms uh, that still are not well defined, but now they are just well defined. So in this case, uh, the able map uh, will be uh, an algebraic. Uh, so amorphism, because it's always algebraic amorphism from C to the generalized Jacobian. In this case, the generalized Jacobian is just an affine space because I don't need to take uh, any quotient. So uh, the theta divisor will be a divisor algebraic uh, in an affine space. So it's going to be an algebraic hypersurface. So it's going to be defined by polynomial. And uh, all, uh, all other curves uh, with this property here uh, satisfy the same. Uh, uh, principle. So the integrals uh, will be given by polynomials. So everything is already polynomial to, uh, algebraic to begin with, and uh, everything stays algebraic. And um, yeah, so I guess the, with this example, I think uh, 
I can conclude. This is all I wanted to say. This is some of this go what I wanted to say more or less. And uh, thank you for the attention.